Okay, good afternoon everyone. It's 3.40, 15.40 if you go by the 24-hour European clock. And uh, welcome to the Developing Inquiry, a webinar. I'm Ruggiero and uh, Byron is sitting next to me running technical. And uh, what we'll be talking about today basically is all material that's stemming from work I've done in my classroom. It's true and tested. It actually works. And um, I'm currently on a four over five, and during this time I've been formally writing up the, the principles of the inquiry process that I've been working with and taking it on the road, doing conferences, doing webinars, doing seminars. And uh, Byron has been a fantastic wing person and mentor in that process. And here's the next slide. C'est l'ordre du jour, which is fancy French words for uh, the agenda. We're going to be looking at fostering an inquiry mindset. We're going to introduce yourselves. Blah. We're going to introduce you to um, the Cosburn inquiry model. Perhaps you've already met it. Perhaps you've been working with myself or Byron or Cloyce. And uh, what you're going to see today is a little bit different in that is the decolonized version of the Cosburn model. So we call it Cosburn 2.0, basically. And you will see what the differences are. Um, why did we do it? Because we're trying to be inclusive of First Nation, Inuit, and Metis people for whom some of these symbols that we were using have different connotations than for other people. So judges and detectives can actually resonate in a rather um, negative colonial manner with our people. And um, consequently, we had to take a quick look at the model, change it, and um, it's named after my school. I was going to name it the me method, but then I thought I like to share. Um, okay, moving on to point three, we're going to be exploring assessment approaches to be used in an inquiry uh, setting. So without further delay, I have to find my little arrow again and here we go boom fostering an inquiry mindset there is good news to be had the mere fact that you are partaking in this webinar indicates that you already have an inquiry mindset awesome what's the next step the next thing that we need to do is to expand the inquiry mindset so that yours expands and then from that position uh, you're in a better place to foster it in your classroom and in your school. So how do we expand your inquiry mindset? Um, there's a number of things that are part, are a reflection of the inquiry mindset. For one thing, um, as a teacher, you're deliberate about your actions. If anybody was to stop you in your classroom as you're doing your thing with the kids and say, why are you doing what you're doing just now? you'd have a logical, pedagogical reason for what you're doing. So deliberate about your actions. Reflecting about your process. Uh, what worked? What didn't work? Which kids were you not able to reach? And looking at stuff and tweaking it, changing it. Um, in my own case, we had to kind of relook the language of the Cosburn model and come up with the decolonized version that's part of reflection. Um, becoming a risk taker and being willing to make mistakes in class in front of your students. Um, this is stuff that we expect of our kids, so we need to be the ones that also front end it and really live it. And creating a pro inquiry environment, something that is safe, kids have the verbal tools to give each other feedback respectfully. Uh, there's that element of accountable talk that we need to model and really create that entire environment. Um, my take home on this slide, for me, because I need to remind myself of it, if we want the kids to do it, we have to model it ourselves. So continuing with the idea of fostering an inquiry mindset, we have a question for you. Um, who asks the questions in your classroom is the question. So this is where using the chat box, you can send us back percentages of what you see as being the num a percentage of questions that you ask and the percentage questions that the students get to ask. 
and it's over to you and we'll give that one minute starting now okay and we're back and um kudos to all of you for the honesty and that actually taking a look at yourselves as if you were the observer walking into your classroom instead of being oh i think that i do this because it's always kind of slightly cooler to to look at yourselves through the eyes of the outsider and really being critical and being the reflective practitioners that you are so this is awesome thank you again for those percentages we're in the process of kind of collating the information that we're getting back during the webinars and we're going to be sharing it back with the participants so um in looking at who asks the questions, we really need to be working towards honoring the fact that students are naturally asking questions. And as teachers, we need to support them in that continuing to ask questions. I teach grade six, and sometimes I honestly sense that my kids come into grade six, and rather than asking their own question, they will ask no questions. So by then, we've, we've already kind of been trained them into thinking that according to the Q chart, we have level one questions, level two questions, and level three and four questions. And rather than asking a level one question, they just ask no questions. So we need to maintain that student-led quality questioning. And the take home here is that all questions matter. We need to debunk the idea of a level one question. Um, so how do we go about that? The way we go about that is by helping the kids focus on the fact that questions are about different things. And there are questions that are about facts, questions about reasons, questions about values, and questions about alternatives. So by using those four filters, and in the Cosburn inquiry model, and it does have an S, it's Cosburn, um, we assist kids in being able to feel confident in the questions that they're asking and there's also a time necessity around questions when you first encounter a topic you need to first find out what the facts are about that topic you can't go into alternatives until you know a lot about what actually happened so um, we can't just jump to the higher order questions without having gone through the other um, types of question. So the way I like to frame it in working with kids is that we really are working with filters, with worldviews, and we actually created characters that kids can relate to and move forward looking at the world the way that these different characters will look at the world. Um, what's going to what's good about the Cosburn inquiry model? And again, there's an S in Cosburn. My autocorrect just decimated the name of my school my apologies uh, it's inclusive students of all academic levels can engage successfully in an inquiry everybody has something that they can bring to the table it's accessible because um, we chunk the question asking process for the students by looking at issues through four different stances through the eyes of four different characters it's non-hierarchic all the questions matter. There is no level one question. There is no level four question. They all matter. And the question askers, those four characters, are relatable. They're four friends that work together at understanding stuff. So here we go. This time, it's a slide that didn't get self-corrected. My apologies for the ones that are missing the ass. This one isn't. Awesome. So it's called the Cosburn Inquiry Model. And we have some visuals. Maybe they're new to you if you've been working with uh, Cosburn 1.0 or 1.1, which was Cloyce's um, adaptation where the robot turned into mechanical questions. We kind of ditched all that and looked at creating non-colonial figures that the kids can work with from the get-go. Um, it's kind of cool because some of the things you might not have seen before, like the fact finder. The fact finder is interested in facts, 
it asks the where and when and the who and the how many and the how much. And that thing that you're looking at, if you're a science geek like I am, it's a Davis Instruments 6250 Vantage View Wireless Weather Station. And it's amazing because it's got an anemometer that measures the wind speed. It's got the little arrowy looking thing at the front that measures wind direction. The little cup container thingy that's underneath the anemometer catches rain and measures the amount of rain. And it's only $489.99 Canadian. And uh, we should all pass the hat and send one to Donald Trump. I didn't really say that. Moving forward, it finds facts. It cannot do anything except focus on those facts and figure out the amount of precipitation and the speed of the wind and the direction of the wind and the temperature and the pressure and all those amazing things that are fact-based questions. So that's our fact finder. The reason finder looks at the way things happened and at the reason those things happen. So we're looking at the whys and hows to create an understanding of what prompted something to happen. So if we're tracking with our fact finder an increase over time in temperatures in our oceans and our, our atmosphere, then we start asking why is that going on? And we start creating those reasons. And uh, moving further into the four characters, the next character is the value finder. And the value finder focuses on the values involved in creating the reasons that led to something happening. So we're asking values. And the question is, is it or is it not with blanks in there? And any student that has ever been in a classroom will already know about values because their strongest value that they look at is fairness. Is something fair or is it not fair? And the value finder weighs those two sides of an issue and reaches a decision. Based on that decision, we're then going to consult with the alternative finder. And if we figured out that something is in fact unfair, we look at what are the alternatives? The How else could something be handled? And we create alternative ways of handling a situation so that if the value that was at, at um, being weighed out was fairness, we find fair alternatives to whatever the situation had been. We're now well positioned to start looking at assessment in an inquiry environment. In the inquiry mindset, What's really, really critical yeah. is to offer students multiple means to record and communicate ongoing changes in their knowledge and understanding. And that was me reading really slowly. But let's chunk it. Multiple means means that they don't just get a pencil and paper test as an assessment. Okay. They don't just get yeah. to hand in a five-paragraph essay as the assessment of an entire inquiry an entire process. So we want to give them multiple means of recording and communicating ongoing changes. So not just at the end you go, okay, this is everything that I've got, I understood, and I learned now. We're tracking the process. And those ongoing changes are changes in their knowledge and in their understanding. And this is where I separated two out because knowledge we can really look at as being factual knowledge, um, subject knowledge, and that is the accumulation of sets of facts that they actually have a handle on and they know. Understanding, I kept separate, in terms of understanding is actually about their ability to process those facts, to have a deep understanding of everything that went with those facts, the reasons around them, the values, societal values around those facts, and that understanding is in a different um, pod from the knowledge. It's not necessarily just the factual knowledge. It's the everything else, the values, the reasons, the alternatives around those facts. So moving to the next slide, um, this is where you get to do some of the 
uh, typing in uh, the chat box, the question that we're asking you is, how are you already offering your students multiple means to record and communicate ongoing changes in their knowledge and understanding? So bullet points, um, and we'll give you a minute to address that, starting now. Okay, I'm going to start jumping back in. This is like the floodgates open. It's amazing. It's lovely. Um, thank you so much. Some of the ideas I will be sort of like repeating in my next slide. A lot of them are light years ahead of what I've already been using in my classroom. And uh, I'm learning from you guys a mile a minute. Thank you very, very much. I think that we're all kind of done typing and um, humbled by everything that you guys shared with us, I will move us to the next slide. And these are just simply some ideas from my own classroom. What I find to be really critical for the kids is to have a performance task, something that is the end point of an inquiry. We want to sort of use backward design in a way in our inquiries in order for the kids to know where it is that we want to get. And all of this is co-created. It's not sort of like the backward planning is done by the teacher uh, in a bubble and then it's sort of like um, opened to the kids once it's all planned. Uh, it's a matter for me to actually make the end product really real for the kids and get them to be invested in finding everything that they can about a topic, packaging, what they have learned and getting it out to an audience, getting it out either to people within the school or politicians, writing letters to Ottawa, whatever the performance task is going to be chosen, is co-chosen with the students to make their inquiry really pertinent. Um, which leads to the next point, authentic artifacts for real audiences. Whether it's a um, podcast, whether it's a presentation by my grade sixes to the grade eights, which always stresses them out, and then they go, oh my God, we survived and we taught the grade eights some stuff. Um, those artifacts, those things that they create to convey a message to a real audience are incredibly important, and this is where you get the buy-in from the students. And they truly get a sense of what they're doing really matters. Um, logistically, keep everything, it all counts. I always say that to my kids. Um, all of it matters. It's not just assessing whatever the end product is. It's the process in an inquiry that's very, very important. This is where we have to give them those uh, multiple means to record and communicate their understanding and knowledge. So they need to keep it. They need to somehow um, create a way of containing and conveying all of their process. What I tend to preferentially use, and I've seen it pop up in what you guys suggested that you're already doing, are learning journals. And learning journals will have, as an inquiry is unfolding, entries being recorded on a daily basis about what the student found easy that day, what they were challenged by that day, something new that they found, some question that they still don't have answers to, and they write about their process in those learning journals. Do I want to sit down and read 30 entries in 30 journals? Not necessarily. And this is where in assessing those journals, the kids are given an opportunity to do their own triage of all the entries and come up with three entries, sort of a beginning, middle, end kind of approach that really demonstrate how their knowledge and understanding has changed over time. And if they do the selecting, you get really quality product and you don't have to read absolutely every entry in every journal. Um, how do we assess those journals? How do we assess those items that they have kept to document their learning? 
I utilize and highly encourage individual conferences because in the end, we want to assess the learner, not the diorama. And that to me is really, really critical. Finding the time to sit down with every student, sometimes it's a bit of a logistical juggle, but meaningful stuff can be happening in the meantime for the rest of the class. And giving the student the ability to bring to the round table whatever artifacts they want to share and three items, three entries from their learning journals opens up a whole different level of communication on their part and of assessment on our part. Um, moving to the next slide, having talked about the few things that I do in my classroom, for you guys also having seen all of the other things that other teachers are using, neighborhood walk with camera. I love you people. Um, let's write a little bit about your next steps. What else will you be offering students in order to give them multiple means to record and communicate ongoing changes in their knowledge and understanding? Okay. As you move forward, one thing that you're going to do, new and different,